That's my style of password as well. <laughs> Would you roll really? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call uh, the school committee meeting for September 8th, 2016 to order. Uh, our first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded, and if everyone could please silence their uh, their cell phones, that would be much appreciated. Uh, this is our first meeting for the, the school year, so it's good to have everyone back. Uh, the first order of business is public comment. Um, is there any public comment? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, the next order of business would be our student report and we're joined by two of our uh, one senior one junior from the high school if you want to come up to the uh, the microphone and introduce yourself for the people at home and why don't you give us a quick uh, summary of what's going on at the beginning of the school year and not much is really going on. Three days of school have started. But with the new year, new principal, there's new reactions. Everyone loves the new principal. Ever since the senior orientation, they're like, oh, she's so sweet. She must have been like el an elementary school teacher. She's so adorable. <laughs> and there's a new gender neutral bathroom. And I think that's such a great idea to have. It's so nice to see that our school is keeping up with the LGBTQ movement. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. And our newest uh, student representative. My name is Cole, and I'm a junior at the North End of our high school. And recently, I helped move in and introduce the freshmen into the new school. And it went very smoothly, and we helped out a lot of the freshmen. And they seem to be liking the high school a lot more than the middle school. And we are also starting to, we're taking a vote to introduce a historian position to the class representatives for the freshman, sophomore, and junior and senior classes, and that is all. <laughs> That's great, Cole. Can I ask a question, Cole? What yeah. would the historian do? They would update social media and keep basically keep control of social media so that, because all the kids now use Instagram and the mm -hmm. social media like that, so they leverage social media to get awareness for different events out there, like dances and other stuff like that. What a cool idea. That's great. Well, thank you for the update, and I hope uh, the rest of the school year goes great for you, too. And we'll Look see you in a few weeks. A couple weeks. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Cole. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving right along on our consent agenda, we have a review uh, and approval of the minutes. Um, I'm happy to take these. Uh, there's three uh, minutes, uh, June 2nd, 2016, June 16th, 2016, and July 27th, 2016. Uh, just for the sake, let's just take uh, each of these one at a time. Um, and I would accept a motion to accept the minutes of June uh, 2nd as they're printed in your packet. So moved. And second. Moved by Mr. Lumpert, second by Mr. McDevitt. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Uh, five nothing vote on that one. Uh, approval of minutes on June 16, 2016. I had to. So accept a motion to approve them as they're put in your packet. Mr. Lippert, yes. Mr. Lippert Mr. makes a motion. Mr. McDevitt seconds it. Oh, the, the, was Mr. that right? Gross. Mr. Gross, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know it came from my left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. That's a 5 0 vote as well. And lastly, uh, July 27, 2016, I'll accept the motion to uh, accept the minutes as printed in your packet. So moved. Second. So, uh, motion by Mr. Limpert, second by Mr. McDevitt. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. That's another 5 0 vote. Thank you. Um, we'll move to the chairs report very briefly. I just wanted to, to recap um, at our last meeting on July 27th, we went over the subcommittees that are going to be in place for um, this upcoming year. Uh, that's also in your packet. And I just wanted to clarify that this is as we agreed to from our, our last uh, last meeting. I don't think there's any changes. The only thing I wanted to just put out is the school building committee that uh, says hiatus there. Um, when and if we get to that, we'd, we'd probably appoint uh, not necessarily these three people, but we'll, uh, we'll take that uh, as it comes. Okay, so I just want to say that these three people are on it waiting to be appointed. But um, the, the, uh, Mr. Tracy, sure. uh, 
the, the subcommittee for whatever we want to call it, uh, uh, elementary school uh, space or something, uh, should that be on the subcommittee list and didn't make it? Um, I think yeah, we did discuss that uh, briefly. I think um, that was the one I was going to be. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I know Mr. Olympic expressed an interest in that, and and I, I think you know when we get uh, a little further down on the agenda, maybe we can, you know, discuss that in more detail on what um, that subcommittee is going to be actually doing. I think yep. that committee uh, and the superintendent can correct me if I'm wrong here probably will not have to take any any action or meet probably for another uh, six eight eight weeks at least. Is that approximately? Thank you. Correct. November, yeah. Yeah, November. Well, the, on the schedule that uh, we'll talk about it when we get Dr. Price yeah. us, there were some intermediate dates, so we might have to think about that. Okay, so maybe we can discuss that when that comes up, Absolutely. and then I think uh, worst case scenario, September 22nd, we could appoint uh, members, and I, again, okay. I know you're uh, strong interested in that, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Limper. Mm -hmm. But um, the rest of them, uh, everybody? Um, Mr. I thought that actually in the, the July meeting that we had appointed Mr. Limper, I, I think I put that in the minutes. To this kind of in between. That's. I thought we'd voted actually. Yeah, I didn't. Hold on, I can tell you. Okay. It's on the school the building page. feasibility liaison. Right. Second motion yeah. of the vote was five zero. Mr. Lippert, as the yes. school building feasibility liaison. I thought that that was the. So I guess we didn't put it as a committee, but that we can put it as a committee, right? Um, it, it, it may be just a liaison. Um, you know, why don't we just hold off on that? Because we're going to okay. discuss it. Okay. And, and, and discuss. Cause I do think I had it as a liaison. Um, yeah. It is, yeah, in the minutes it is as a liaison, not, not a subcommittee. So um, but I think what we talked about at our last meeting was when we actually build a school, we actually have to appoint a school building committee. Mm -hmm. um, and we weren't sure what the needs were going to be at this point because the feasibility study is still going mm -hmm. on. So um, I, I think. I'm, I'm pretty confident Mr. Lippert's going to be the liaison to that committee, yeah. uh, that, that group. Sure, sure. I, okay. I just want to be sure nope. somebody is I think involved. I think you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't think we need a motion, so I just wanted to review it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Fine. All good. All good. All good. Uh, the other uh, update, and um, Mr. Gross, you can jump in after. Um, I want to update people on the, the legal counsel search that we're working with the town on. Um, just to recap very quickly for those watching at home, uh, the town has decided to bring the uh, school, the, the town council position in-house, so to speak. Uh, we've had outside council for forever, and uh, it was the, the Board of Supplements wish to bring uh, an outside person, uh, an inside person inside. That's repetitively redundant, I'm sorry. Um, but anyways, uh, we've had a, uh, a search going all summer long. Uh, we got like 24, 25 resumes uh, for the job. We were very impressed with the quality of the resumes. Uh, myself, uh, Superintendent Price, and uh, Mr. Gross have been part of that subcommittee, and we, we appreciate uh, being part of that. Um, we've had uh, we've we've cut the the list from uh, from 25 down to six, and I think we're down to the final four right now. We have uh, some more interviews next week. But uh, I think everyone who's on the subcommittee has been very impressed with the quality of candidates. And uh, I think the goal is to appoint someone, uh, the Board of Selectmen would appoint someone because it is actually their appointment, not our, not our appointment, um, by the end of the month. Um, that's the goal, at least, and that's what we're shooting for. Mr. Gross, one And then we would have that person come and meet all of you at the October 13th meeting. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah, that, I was going to comment on that the rest of the committee would uh, have the opportunity to meet the person there. Uh, the only comment I wanted to make, and, and yes, the quality and caliber of the candidates is very impressive. Um, the last round of, uh, of interviews, there were some simulated uh, scenarios, which I think really got to the essence of mm -hmm. how people think and how they operate and how they um, how they resonate with with uh, different members of the boards and, and the municipal and, and school side. Um, one thing I did want to mention: this person would be in addition to other specialty legal services that the school committee would still uh, likely retain, such as for special ed needs and whatnot, but would, would be able to take on the bulk of the process, policy, um, and you know, personnel. HR type and personnel issue or personnel um, advice and guidance as well. So, um, looking forward to. Uh, the next round of these interactions, um, I know whoever uh, this Board of Selectmen uh, advance are going to be extremely qualified and well fit for the position. I'm looking forward to uh, standing behind that decision and seeing what opportunity we have to take advantage of that and um, move forward. 
I agree, Mr. Mr. Gross. I think it's been a, been a great process. And um, as he mentioned, I, I think that if uh, the need comes up that we need to uh, bring someone else on board, we'll, we'll do that. And I, I do think we're still hoping to do an RFQ sometime this this fall for our own uh, council to have on, on retainer uh, as well. Um, other than that, I just want to say that I, I know, uh, you know, this is my first year as a parent um, <laughs> having school opening, and I think it was a, a very smooth, uh, at least as far as the kitchen school goes. Um, very happy. I know my uh, my son uh, eagerly got on that bus uh, on Wednesday morning, and uh, it's been a, a real good week to start with. So I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Dr. Price and her team has to say about uh, the opening of school. <clears throat> So I'll start with that. I'll jump in. Um, yeah, we all feel very strongly that at all eight schools, it was a pretty smooth opening. Um, and uh, we've been in all of them multiple times between the assistant superintendents and myself. I think we've, I think they're sick of seeing us already. So, um, <laughs> and I feel free to jump in, any of you. But it's it was very smooth opening. Um, it seems that. Um, you know things get going and we always I always love walking around the high school on the first day because if you think about 1400 kids and I always make it so simple to say they're all in the right box and there's a teacher with them it's pretty exciting <laughs> to have uh, that happen um, you know we, we we didn't haven't lost a kindergartner on the bus so <laughs> they got there and they got back um, and as you can see um, there's just a lot of joy in the classrooms and it's been really fun to see that um, and I would also say it's been really fun to get into the classrooms with all the new technology in the schools um, mm. and seeing teachers today we had a, a training for the document cameras and I had was had a little fun with tweeting out a picture of a old overhead projector Mm -hmm. saying you know no longer needed in the North Andover Public Schools and um, the network has been dramatically enhanced over the summer um, we had I think eight Chromebook cards going at the middle school and they all at the same time and they all worked very well so awesome. just as exciting to see some changes um, I'd also say I was in a kindergarten class um, with our new behavior technician uh, model and watching students who would have been in a more sub separate program in the past being really thoughtfully included in a very supportive way so there's some really fun things going on we've had a lot of fun Hmm. Anything, Dan? Yeah, and I'd just like to thank you again for supporting the Student Services Department and the position that I have. I met with my staff um, last week, actually, Thursday morning, and they're all just so enthusiastic about being under one umbrella and having the capacity to work together. Uh, we talked a lot about what all students means and how that can impact students across the board. Whether you have a 504 or an IEP or you're just a general education student, um, so very enthusiastic. I've done some rounds in the schools um, this week, and everything's running smoothly and looking great. And just the enthusiasm is fantastic. So thank you again for that. Thank you, Don. You're on the clock, Gilly. Yeah, Thirty seconds. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a great opening, especially for the teachers. It was a great uh, first couple of days of professional development. And um, I, I think, like Dr. Price said, between <clears throat> the four of us, I think we've been at every school multiple times, checking in to make sure everyone has what they need to get off and running. And I have to say, it was almost like we never left. It was pretty smooth opening. Um, so really excited. And, and kudos to our principals. I mean, they really are yeah. the ones who open these buildings and get ready for the kids, and they've done an amazing job. Yeah. And lastly, I just add the custodial staff. I mean, yeah. it was... It's probably, I think it's the best the schools have looked opening school. I, I won't say a long time because it's been good in the past years, but this was just a uh, really nice job by a custodial staff this summer. So. That's great. And you haven't said anything about busing, so I assume busing looked fine. Right? Yeah. That was what I was going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. 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 Mr. Mealy. <laughs> I was going to echo the custodians and food services all do a great job. Um, a particular shout out to our new transportation coordinator, Lucy McCarthy. Um, Lucy, if you don't know, was our payroll coordinator. And with the consolidation um, with the town of payroll and the retirement of our former transportation coordinator, Lucy stepped into that position. And not only that, but we threw at her a change in software, so she had to redo all the routes. Um, <laughs> they were a little late, you know, later than usual in getting the uh, information to parents, but the parents have been very good in understanding. Um, and Lucy's had a pit in her stomach for the last couple of weeks and will for the next couple. Um, <laughs> but compared to other years, it's the same. You know, there are some people who will call with some issues about can this stop be changed or the ride seems a little long or the bus is a little crowded. And what we do is we lock the routes for the first couple of weeks and then we work through those issues and things work themselves out. So it's going well. That's great. That's great. Can I ask a quick question about that? 
So uh, um, I've heard from a number of people just how early some of the kids are getting at schools. Yeah. So once kind of the roots kind of get redefined, do you conceivably think that those will get kind of Possibly, adjusted yeah. back? We actually were talking about that this morning, um, especially at the high school. Yeah. Um, they were getting there early, and so what we have to see is how much time is there between the time they're leaving the high school and they need to be at their next spot. And if it's more time than is needed, we can move up the time in so that they're getting there a little later. Okay. Yep. And then, um, are St. Michael's students riding the buses? As they well? they have a run, correct? But are they riding with our students on our buses as well? No, they okay. have their own routes. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask is um, there's a couple of kids who um, I know had been going to St. Mike's and were on the bus, and my kids were like, oh, you know, like they're still, mm. like they continue on. So I think they may have actually been at St. Mike's, you know, in prior years and have now transitioned back over. So mm. that's where I, there I, may have been some confusion. I, I, I thought the, our bus route, uh, I think, I thought our bus route came here and then went to St. Mike's afterwards. They Correct. Do. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, they're on the same bus with us, though. No. No. No, they do another they do after after right. They have to oh. they yeah. wait. Okay. They have to wait till we finish our route and then they go. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, must, I must misread the bus route. Yeah, and that, that's what I think confused me. And it was just the former St. Mike's kids. That it could. I, I'll okay. confirm that. I'll okay. Check. Yeah. Awesome. You know. Thank you. Yep. So, so I'd now like to introduce um, Carrie Walter. I'm sorry, before, before you go there, yeah. Mr. Oh. Chair, it might be helpful if we could get some statistics out of the you know, longest route. Uh, arrival time at school just so that we uh, can get an update once the system stabilizes. We'll so need a few weeks because yeah. they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, yeah. maybe one of the October meetings we can sure. discuss yeah. that. Just so that, that. We, can, yeah. we can take a look at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, no problem. No, I think. Uh, okay. So I'd now like to introduce um, our new Director of Human Resources, Carrie Walbert. Um, and Welcome. I gave you her, her resume. Mm -hmm. We talked about her at our um, retreat, but she wasn't yet on board. So I thought it would be great to have Carrie come. North Andover resident, lives in a historic home here, actually, in North Andover. <laughs> we won't say which one on television, but a historic home. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, comes to us um, from being the Director of Personnel in Delrico for the last three years, and then prior to that, working um, in the Human Resources Department and LA Unified. <coughs> um, and then uh, started uh, her career as a special education teacher. So, um, Carrie, we're really excited to have you. And um, I think you're really excited about your commute. I'm very excited about my commute. I can walk. I've not done so yet, but I'm very excited to be here. It's been a great, warm, welcoming community, um, both living here and working here. I mean, I think the teachers have already, a lot of the staff, I should say, um, principals, teachers, um, other employees have already reached out to me and asked for some help and guidance and we're working towards a lot of um, new projects. One of the things is, um, and I just found out there's another one uh, with the Y and then Cedardale, some, some health and wellness things that I can push to the, to the um, staff and I think they're really excited about that so mm -hmm. far. So it's been great. Welcome board. Any questions from the, from the board for uh, Ms. Wahlberg? I just have a quick question. So I know you kind of um, do the HR piece, but um, in terms of retirement and, and planning for that and mm -hmm. the, the retirement board, do you also work with the teachers for that or is that something completely outside of your scope? In terms of kind of explaining the process and what Correct. that's actually going to be a part of um, where, I, where we're doing the fourth grade fit money and we're actually going to implement that with the teachers so that it will kind of come with that but also as a person who's been in that retire in those retirement systems, I can walk them through the process. So as I get here and as the questions come up, I will be working with them. Okay, so when they're filling out their own, like, like as, as they look for their records and all of that stuff, that right. that kind of all goes with you. That yes, that's part of the on. Well, as a new teacher, we'll do it as onboarding because a lot of them are so young they don't think about those things. So we'll start kind of grooming them for that at this okay. point, and then working with the the current teachers and other staff for retirement as those issues come up. So as I get a feel for what is needed, then I can build sort of a program around that. Great. Thank you. Good. 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 Mr. Chair, the question, is there a formalization of the onboarding process? Is, is that a priority or? Yes, it, it's definitely a priority. Uh, we just went through the cycle of hiring everyone new, so, and I wasn't quite here for that. So I'm looking back at what was done this summer, sort of ad hoc, and then um, for next year it'll be smooth. 
However, that being said, Carrie did meet with all the new teachers on the day that they were here, which I has not been part of the process in the past, and mm. helped explain benefits and all of that. So even kind of, you weren't even officially on board at right. that point. And at least having the face and knowing that there's someone to ask if, mm. you know, at least they know to come to me and then I can find out the answer as I learn as well. Excellent. Great. So the class of 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll welcome aboard. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Thank, Thank you. We're excited Thanks. to have you. I'm Absolutely. happy to be here. That's right. You'll be home in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Two. It's, right. a two, it's a two minute commute. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> the next thing I, I wanted to do, and I'm always a little anxious to do this so early um, in the year because. Um, We've registered five students mm -hmm. since I sent this to you last night and today. So, um, and then you know, kids will drop out who we thought were showing up who did who didn't. So, I just really wanted to take a moment to just talk to you a little bit about where we are in terms of class sizes. So, um, Jim has this. I, somehow, I think we the copy didn't get on the back. So. Um, I just want to, sh to show you, um, this is a K and 1, and this is a, the bar across is our, our target. So if you look at the bar, that's our class size goal of 22. And you can see in K, other than at Thompson, all of our K averages are above. Um, at, uh, and in first grade, um, it, uh, we had a small K last year. So other than at Atkinson, um, our, we have smaller class sizes in one. So I just wanted to show you where we are. Um, and then you can see the same in two and three. Um, and then the class size goal jumps up to 25 and three. So you can see that that's, that's our goal. Um, two almost, except for Franklin is above. Um, and you can see grade three, the class size average, um, because it jumps up most or below, except for at Franklin. It's just always a challenge. And then um, four and five, um, we have some pretty big fifth grade classrooms right now. Um, very concerning uh, about some of our fourth and fifth. Um, now, this was the last slide I wanted to show you was something that, not the last one, the next slide I wanted to show you was if last year, if you remember, I looked at what percentage of our class sizes were above our targets. So last year, because we had about 80 fewer students, um, we got down to 40%, which I said was good, but still 40% of our class sizes are above. Um, we're not moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, we're back up to 46% of our class sizes are above the target as of right now in our schools. Um, and you can see um, the average class size per school is actually very close to each other. Um, you can see our largest average class size is at Kittredge. Um, and then at, at Atkinson and Thompson, um, and then Franklin and Sargent. Often our larger schools can absorb class size a little bit better. Um, right. You know, mm -hmm. Kittredge is so tricky. Not right. with only two. Super great. Yeah, it's just it's a tough situation. And I, I just wanted to show you kind of, so we're up 78 kids. What I sent you last night was 73. Like I said, we registered five kids today. Um, <laughs> and I think it's important to see um, on, on this, you can see that our kindergarten kit, we're up about over 40 students in kindergarten, um, which we had a low kindergarten last year. Uh, we're back to a higher kindergarten. Um, and then um, you can also see that we have, as we always do, we lost some, we're down a few students in the middle school at sixth grade and a few at the high school. Um, but if you just look at the total numbers, um, the, where we are seeing our biggest growth this year is actually Thompson is exploding. 46 mm. additional students as of today. Mm. Um, our elementaries have a total of 91 additional kids over where we were last year um, and on, on October 1. Um, our middle school is just up 11, and then our high school is down 24. Much better, thank you, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. I just think it's important to, I, again, I'm always anxious, and we'll do a full class size report, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's important for you guys to see beginning of school, we're up 78 kids where we were. Our class sizes are bigger than they were last year. Teachers are feeling it. Mm -hmm. Parents are feeling it. Um, mm -hmm. And Thompson is feeling it. And, and the Delta's year over year. Is that what they did from last, last year, year to this year? I just did one year's yeah, worth, yeah, um, other than the average class, the percentages above. Okay. I can say I, I walk my fourth grader to the Thompson School, and sometimes we stand up above and you can watch the kids in the playground. And today, everybody was there. You could feel yeah. the volume. It, it was 
packed with action. It was everybody's <laughs> happy, but there, you could feel a lot more kids. That's and true. you know, I, I do want to remind this uh, committee that we did add a first grade classroom at Thompson uh, at the end of last year. Thank goodness we did, <laughs> um, or we would be um, mm. in a crisis situation, in my opinion, right, uh, mm. right now there, mm. um, with over 31 or 32. Um, and you know, Thompson is a small school, so 46 kids at Thompson is a lot of kids. Right. Right. Um, you know, 30 kids at Sargent is, just doesn't feel as many. You know? Yeah, the surge in the past week at Thompson and Atkinson with quite a few registrations. Just a few years ago, Thompson was at 312, and they're at 369 today. Maybe 370 as of. Wow. Like, it, wow. It, it, like the middle school, is some of that uh, the, with that bubble class going through? Yes. So the bubble class is the is the current eighth grade class, okay. so the high yeah. school numbers will go up pretty large. So that, that, uh, that is what. Accounts for the seventh, the right. seventh grade going down, and the eighth grade yep. going up from here. Yep, yeah, you can absolutely see that. That's okay. a bubble class moving okay. through. Mr. Chair, question? Yeah, sure. So, um, we, we know that uh, some of the developments in town are now going to be taking on resources and people. Um, do we know what district they're going to be in? For example, Barry. Yep. So um, we are very keenly aware of all this. We'll talk a little about this in in, in a in a moment, but. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Mealy went to the zoning board, uh, the planning, planning board, this week to talk about the impact. So I'm going to turn it over to you on that question. We're going right, to jump, I, I jump to that now. Do you want to jump to that now? Or? So yeah, why don't we do that? Let me do one more thing about so, Alice, and then we'll come back to that's it. That's fine. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're going to have a, a larger conversation about that, I, I, I think. But one, one thing I, I do want to make sure uh, in our next meeting we. we we look at these numbers again. I'd like to see, you know, where the soft spots are and if they continue to grow or decrease a little bit. So let's put this picture. We'll, we'll probably see a little bit of a decrease because we don't have all the ghosts, as we call them, yeah. out yet. Um, and again, that's why I'm anxious to share it. But the trend is more. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, the last question I was going to ask: Can I see slide five one more time, please? Yeah. And can we? When did we open with ECC? It's off that chart, right? It's prior to 2011. It's K to five. Right. So this is just K to five. Okay, but uh, when? No, sorry. When did we close Bradstreet? That was two thousand five. Prior to long, long time, long long time. way before that. Okay. So yeah, as we as we flesh out the actual numbers and we make the proposal, it'd be nice to see some projections of what the impact of the plan will have on, mm -hmm. on per school. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I ask? Sure. Good. Mr. Miller, could you go back to slide seven? To yes, seven, please. So when we look at that, we're comparing. Are we comparing? For example, the ninth grade this year to yes. ninth grade last year, year or eighth yes. grade? Ninth uh, to ninth. ninth so ninth. it's just simply, so a lot of it is just uh, ebbs and flows of size of classes. Yes. Um, but things like kindergarten is, okay, we got a bigger kindergarten class entering. That's important to know. Yeah. So one thing that would be curious, uh, or I would be curious about, is if we could compare last year's eighth grade to okay, this year's freshman class and for a couple of reasons. I mean, th these numbers, you know, they tell something, but we saw a very big trend for a while of students who were leaving North Andover at the end of their eighth grade to go to an outside high school. And we saw the pendulum start to swing over the past couple of years where students were returning back. So I think in looking at that, I would say there's 65 students who have left. And yeah, I think that's that that's, right. a, that's a misrepresentation. So we are going to do a massive class size. We always come up yes. with that number. This okay. was literally just a this quick. This is what I was yeah. in my head, yes. Yeah. 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 But, we're, but that's for uh, you know a big presentation. Sure. This was just a quick, you know, where are we today? Okay. And then my other question kind of on that, when we looked at, for example, like 6th and 7th grade, I'd be curious to see because um, I know last year's sixth grade was the first year that St. John's Prep, for example, opened um, a middle school, but I'd be curious to see if we're losing kids between fifth and sixth, seventh grade as they start to perhaps enter into a Yeah, we, can, we will do the same so thing fifth and sixth. Thank and, you. you know, I understand that that's a concern. We're busting at the seams. Oh, and I, if I, I know and, that. And if... You know, I, people start. <laughs> it, it's a double-edged sword on all sides of this. Frankly. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when, when I was down in the high school today, all the quite of the voters were there, and that was the question on a lot of the folks' minds. They saying, "Well, what about Berry Street?" You know, I heard that they're going to start registering and moving in, and then, you know, they were talking about um, 125 across from lots of Eads, and, and they were asking how many folks we're going to have. Um, and you know, the, the answer is we have to take them as they come. Um, but Jim did a really nice job of the planning board talking about, you know, 
you know, uh, income levels, uh, size of the apartments available, all those different factors. And I think it really made a few folks on the planning at least aware right. that this is something we're keenly watching in the schools because it affects us greatly, uh, especially if there's mid-year occupancy. You know, like Berry Street, for example, there's some that have already registered, but there's probably more for October or November. Yeah. And it's a good thing it's in the Sergeant District. Yes. I think when we start talking about the strategic plan, I'd like to Mr. Mealy to weigh in then on, on, on that. That'd be great. Do you want to just quickly hit on yep. Alice? Yeah, so I just want to um, let folks know that we did a full day, a full two hour training for um, Alice, which is the Alert Lockdown Inform Counter Evacuate program that we talked extensively about last spring. Um, the police came in um, and did a two hour training uh, the first day of teachers being back. Um, we are now going to go to each individual school and do a training because there is differentiation at each school in terms of the physical structure and also at each level in terms of how you talk to kindergartners is very different than how you talk to seniors. And so um, we did an extensive training. Um, myself, the chief of police and the chief of the, uh, and the fire chief will be writing a letter out to parents jointly to explain this. And when we meet with the PTO co-presidents on September 22nd, I'm gonna talk to them about holding um, information sessions in their schools um, this fall. So um, we are in the process of rolling it out. It is a process. Um, and I felt that the only time we would really have to train our teachers was that first day, so we did it. Miss um, Mabley was there. Do you have anything? I, I thought it was amazing. I enjoyed participating. It was a scary, exciting process to actually hear gunshots and all this sort of things that they did for the teachers. Um, but I talked to a lot of the teachers, and they were very enthusiastic that it's going to be more in their control to make a decision whether or not they can escape. And um, it was it was really great start, and I thought that the um, the police department did a phenomenal job, and all the, the support staff they brought with them were amazing. I, I just really want to echo that. I mean, I spoke to a couple of teachers <laughs> afterwards, and they um, initially were um, a little I, I want to say almost emotional. It's at, very at emotional hearing, <laughs> at hearing gunshots. I mean, mm -hmm. I know there were blanks or you know whatever right. the, the pops, um, and how that just felt in a school, but how empowered they felt um, and I think that's part of the whole Alice program yes. and, um, I know as a parent like you know when you, you hear of things that happen and even you know I think Haverhill today had a, a, a scare or something like that you know like you don't know how well people are prepared um, but knowing and understanding that all of our teachers went through this program um, is just it, it, it's reassuring yeah you know and, and hopefully and yeah, the we statistics never, are quite impressive right. that if you know people involved in something like this actually react, the probability of people being okay is so much higher. And so, you know, as I said to the teachers, I said, you know, this is a tough way to start school. However, if there's a program that law enforcement and everyone is saying has the highest probability of keeping you and the kids safe, you know, how do I go to bed at night if we don't do right. it? And so I think um, they heard that and they um, responded. And I will tell you, it was, it was incredibly emotional. Mm -hmm. And we acknowledge that. We spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on the emotions of it because it's hard. It will, will there be re recurring training like fire drill training? Yeah, so what we will do is we will train in each building mm -hmm. because the teachers have a lot of specific questions about their building mm -hmm. and then once that training is over, I've already talked with the fire and the police chief, we will do some training um, and then our hope is actually to combine some fire drills with some lockdown drills so that mm -hmm. we're not um, cutting too much into instructional time. Right. So I had a good meeting with, you know, we're really, this is a joint effort among all three of us. Mm -hmm. And as we spoke during the Alice, that would also be with some parental notifications. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. people would be we're going to work with the PTOs yes. on that. So mm -hmm. I, I um, again, this is not like it's done. We're just starting down the process, but we needed to do it the first day if we were going to actually address it. Well, thank you for doing that, and, and thanks to the fire chief and the police chief for making their staff available to, uh, to assist us with that. They've been great. Okay. Uh, Moving on to old business, I just want to quickly finalize the school committee meeting schedule for the rest of this uh, calendar year for 2016. Um, we presented a calendar uh, for the members back in July. Um, there was a request to move a few dates. Uh, I think we were able to accommodate one of them um, from moving the 6th to the 13th. Um, if there's any other uh, discussion, I would. Uh, Accept a motion to uh, approve this this calendar as presented in the packet. So moved. Second. Uh, made and seconded. Any discussion from anyone? 
Yeah, so um, still we'll try to do as much uh, schedule aerobics to accommodate as possible if there will be some remote, remote participation requests. Great move. Okay. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. This is our school committee calendar for the rest of the year. And I'd imagine probably um, at the November or first December meeting, we'd um, lock down, uh, if not sooner, lock down the, the calendar for uh, the rest of the, uh, the uh, school year. Thank you for accommodating what, what was accommodated. <laughs> You're welcome, Mr. Gross. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, further discussion of the strategic plan. Um, I know uh, Dr. Price presented it to us uh, in July. She has since uh, presented it to the teachers, and I thought uh, it was very well received on opening day with the, uh, the entire staff. I think what we wanted to do after talking with um, Mr. Limpert and uh, Superintendent Price last week, that we wanted to, uh, to go over it again because uh, it was in the middle of July we did this and it wasn't recorded at the time, so I think the public um, who's watching at home, all 10 of you. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, Superintendent could just go. Yeah, what I thought we would do is, um, I also did send this out as part of my uh, September newsletter to parents, so um, uh, just a little bit uh, about the process. We worked on it in July, we made some revisions, we presented it to our entire leadership team who took uh, actually a morning to look at it and give us some feedback. Um, and actually get into some of the next phases, which is the depth of like who's in charge, what's the date, how do we get it done, which I haven't presented tonight. We're not quite done with that part. Um, presented it to the full faculty at the opening day, kind of high level conversation about it. Um, each principal is gonna talk to their faculty about what the strategic plan means for their buildings over the next few weeks. Um, and uh, so we have made some revisions, uh, continue to do so. Um, but what I thought would be make the most sense tonight is since we did present this in July, not to rehash this, but we've made some changes. And so I thought I'd just talk about the changes that we've made. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start with the kind of the first uh, overview page. Um, we did put in a safe learning environment. Um, I, I, I will say that we did get one email yesterday wondering if it should be positive instead of safe, if safe, what connotations that word has. But we did enter safe. Other than that, we did not change the vision. And as I talked about, I think keeping the vision the same is important as we keep continuity in the schools. Um, and then the only other, um, if you look at the strategic objectives based uh, on, we made the change on uh, other under all students, understand and manage emotions was a change that we made. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first page. And what I thought I would do is just have each of the assistant superintendents take the part they explained to you and explain what the changes were per uh, that. Um, I would ask if it's okay with you, Mr. Teresi, that we go through everything other than the conversations about um, reducing class size at the sure. elementary level, and we'll do that. We'll do that after that. Okay, so uh, Dr. Strait, if you would take the, uh, the first one around all students. Okay, great. So the first strategic initiative is improve districts programming to address students' variable needs with a focus on increasing opportunities for inclusion. And the piece that we decided to add in phase one centers on our parents and helping our parents with the understanding of that aspect of it as well. Um, it's one thing to do a lot of work in initiatives here in the school environment, but we want to be able to share that out and bring parents in to, to develop that understanding. So that's really the only change we made to that first one. In that area. And then I'm going to skip this one. You can go on to the... Then the third area is increasing support and understanding for social emotional learning. And we discussed all of the initiatives and programming that we've put in place. We uh, also wanted to add the Scarlet Night Academy, which meets the needs of our high school students who have some variable needs centered on their learning and their time. Um, and their capacity to really work on a full high school schedule. So we wanted to make sure we didn't ignore that because that's a key element of it. Um, this third piece is the improving communication co collaboration between regular ed and special education teachers. So some of what we're looking at is um, providing some training and support to facilitate the co-teaching model that we're piloting at the high school level. So I'm working with the high school principal, um, and Gilly's involved in it, and we're looking at how we can improve that collaboration so that we have a true co-teaching model and they have mentors that can provide some of that feedback to 
the teachers, as well as looking at the grade level collaboration meetings um, centered on the new writing workshop approach that we're taking. So we've allowed you know special ed, general education teachers all to attend that and ensure that they're all working together on those initiatives as well. So those are really the only changes we've made mm -hmm. um, since we talked about it last time. Okay. Any any question on the board on the changes at all? No. Seeing none. Continue. Okay, uh, Mr. Mealy. Moving on to uh, professional practice part. Sounds like it's just going to cooperate. There you go. So under professional practice, not a lot of differences um, than what you had seen originally. Um, we had included. Uh, library media specialists as something that had been put in place that hadn't been listed uh, previously. And in addition to that, in phase one, uh, we have added a new teacher mentoring program review um, that would result in some recommendations being made that would then be acted on in phase two and meet with our leadership teams. I keep messing that up. Um, the facility um, collab facilitators for collaborative of, inquiry, right? Uh, <laughs> professional development for the year, mm -hmm. and that's it for uh, professional development. And really, the changes, everything else, we kept the same in right. terms of um, uh, in terms of effective school level leadership, and then uh, developing a comprehensive human resources <coughs> model. We saw Carrie and all of her work. So, question? Sure. Well, first of all, I, I think we also talked about maybe with footnotes, putting the TLAs, the three letter acronyms. So yes, we're going to do a whole part of that. By, by yep. mortals. But I, I, the question <laughs> I was related to um, the mentoring program. Is that under the direction of the curriculum coordinators, the building supervisors, or HR? Mr. Gilligan. That's the, the mentoring works with us. So, um, we actually have, I oversee the mentoring program, okay. and um, we also have a coordinator who's an administrator in our district, the assistant principal at the middle school, Cheryl Raimondo. Mm -hmm. And then we actually have mentor teachers uh, at each level. And I'd have to say, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but in addition to just the traditional state requirements to uh, meet the mentoring, to move on to your next certification, et cetera, for our new folks, um, we were really fortunate this year. We added a three-day training um, based on Research for Better Teaching, RBT. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a course called The Skillful Teacher Preparing for the First Years. So we have targeted our new teachers in their first, second, or third year to take a course for three days throughout the course of this year um, to better help them in addition to the regular mentoring that we provide. Hmm. And I think both Mr. Gillian and I believe that we need to take an extensive look at our mentoring um, program because uh, the way it is currently structured, there's not necessarily a mentor in each building for each teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and the concept is a good one, um, and I think it's fiscally restrained because of that. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we feel that there should be someone in the building for the teachers if we could make that work. And so that's really our, our goal is not necessarily the training or the process, but maybe the number of mm -hmm. mentors that we have. And that would be critical as we go into negotiations because they were negotiated last time. A particular number was negotiated Correct. between um, the committee and the teachers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we may want it. So that's that's why if we look at it this year, we're we'll entering into IPB. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And the, the new teacher definition is new to district or new to job? New to, new to the district. New to the district. And I will say that as we have we have 25 spots in this Research for Better Teaching course, very excited about it, um, and as we made decisions about allocating those limited spots, teachers with the least amount of experience, whether in this district or in other districts, were actually given <coughs> preference. So we have some new teachers who have, have 10 years of experience. They were not given preference over others. Thank you. Good. Interesting. Any other questions uh, on that? No. Last. And then the last one is um, uh, really looking at consistent and rigorous curriculum. Mr. Gilliam. Great. I think one of the changes you'll see there just highlighted is um, down to phase one. Create a consistent documentation of the math curriculum pre-K through 12 and review instructional resources for a recommendation at the end of the year. As many of you may know, we spent this summer with a math committee comprised of folks um, at all the levels, pre-K through 12, and they really did a couple things. They looked at what are the essential understandings um, that we want to teach from grade level to grade level, what kids should know and be able to do, uh, how are we assessing them, and then the third stage, and it's ongoing, is what are the materials, resources, lessons, activities, what are we going to need 
to make a recommendation going forward. What are the materials we need in order for math to progress next year uh, across the district? Um, so that was there. Um, as you can see below, uh, underneath, there was um, a piece about the science standards, um, grade seven and eight, implementing the new science standards is in phase two. Uh, we're currently in phase one right now this summer. Uh, North Andover participated. Carol Lockholm was a really key player in it, our STEM coordinator, curriculum coordinator, uh, with 17 other cr districts um, working together to map the new science standards and all that goes along with it. So it was really a collaborative effort across communities. Uh, and there's several, there's three more meetings coming up this fall, two in Bill Ricker and one in Tewksbury. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, as you slide over a column um, in phase one, I think you'll see something new there. It says assess the needs for a math coach. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, you know, what do we want kids to know and be able to do? Well, what are we going to do if kids don't get it? And when we talk about response to intervention or providing a tiered system of support, um, one of the things that's worked well for us, and you've seen it firsthand, is there's only so much intervening you can do. Um, you know, if we had a lot more money, we'd have more interventions than the 2.5 we have in the elementary year of or long literacy. Um, but one of the things that we've seen success in is with our reading coaches, Jackie and Ann. Mm -hmm. So working with teachers, particularly on tier one intervention in the classroom, um, we've run most of our elementary teachers through their trainings of coaching cycles, where they observe, give feedback, and those are six-week cycles, and we've talked about that. And then the running records training, um, stuff around the workshop model, and uh, leveled literacy. I mean, they've been really phenomenal. And um, what really gets me excited about it is when you see people who are really good teachers and the veteran teachers saying, this was awesome to do the six-week coaching cycle with uh, our two reading staff were really awesome. Mm -hmm. We want to take a look and think about how can we also replicate that in mathematics. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we need two for math. I think we start with one, but um, let's face it, the, you know, the more that we can uh, provide meaningful feedback and assist those teachers, particularly in helping kids who are struggling in that tier one intervention in the classroom, that's where we're going to get our most bang for the buck, and that's really what best practice is. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that we're really looking forward to have a serious discussion about during the budget season coming up, because I think that's needed. Mm -hmm. And I think starting K to five would be a good spot with that. So mm -hmm. that's in phase two. Um, as you slide over a column and you talk about innovative learning-centered experiences that allow students to apply their knowledge to authentic experiences. Um, I mean, I'd echo what uh, the principal of North Andover High School said last time she was here, Deb Holman, uh, when we were talking about some of those senior capstones and, and really uh, real-life learning. But um, stuff that the DECA and robotics and the chorus and band have been doing, but also we started to discuss some of those service trips and some of those other visits, such as the Yellowstone Ge Geological Travel Course. Um, you know, and you had Kelly Driscoll in this year to talk about some of the service learning down in the Dominican. Um, and last but not least, I, I really can't uh, emphasize enough how important our partnership with the Stevens Memorial Library has been. Um, so on opening day for all new staff, um, they got to take a bus tour with me. I think we talked about this last time. But we did stop at the library. And I can't tell you how much Kathleen Keenan has been accommodating and working so closely with Jen, but also with myself and Lorene Marks and all of us. Um, every new teacher got a like an Oscars bag. It didn't quite have the swag like a tag <laughs> or a watch or anything, but it had reading literacy materials and everyone got a library card who's new to the district. Um, and, and it was really nice. I'd probably say the biggest highlight um, for those who don't know is um, really the work, and I'm going to say, Jen did a really nice job working with Kathleen Keenan, but I have to call out Lorene Mark. She's done a Amazing. fantastic job on the um, one book, one community project. Mm -hmm. So working with the school and the library combined, um, Jackie Woodson's coming. And those of you who, know, who haven't read Jackie Woodson, um, you know, um, she's just remarkable. She, is, um, she recently won the National Book Award for her memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming. In August, um, another book came out, Another Brooklyn. Um, so, but she writes books that are appropriate for kids in kindergarten, and she writes for young adults, and she writes for adults. Um, she's the National Young People's Poet Laureate. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, this is a, you know, for those of you who aren't, you know, really into books and reading, <laughs> this is a huge deal for North Andover to be able to get someone of this caliber to come and talk. Um, and even in my home this summer, it was funny because the, everyone was reading a different one. I was reading Brown Girl Dreaming, um, and it was really cool. She talks a little bit about her struggle in Brown Girl Dreaming, about how she used to mix words up 
you know, she might have been even a little bit dyslexic. And just she talked about her own writing process, and now she's this like world famous superstar. Um, but she's coming to North Andover, and she's going to be meeting with our kids. But she's also going to be doing something in the evening for parents, and um, it it. It's a big What's deal. Hmm. It's going to be uh, the day after the Monday after Thanksgiving, November twenty eighth, um, and she'll be coming uh, to the school in the day, and then there's going to be a community event that night. Hmm. So um, we're pretty thrilled about that. And also, as you know, I believe Dr. Price. Yes. Oh, no. so, uh, that we just hired a. Well, go ahead. Well, I, I think, well, we had hired... We just a, had hired an embedded librarian, which is, <laughs> if you remember, um, mm -hmm. we've, uh, we had one, and then... He seems a little more excited than you are. Yeah. So maybe you should... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I didn't know. I, I was, it's I, done. It's okay, done. It's done. It's done. Deal. Got Keep Chris Farley jumping up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we... Um, <laughs> we... Uh, <laughs> we had hired an embedded librarian, and then um, before she officially signed on, she resigned and took a job somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So most recently, we get this done deal now. So it's finalized. So we have an embedded librarian that work half time in the schools, half time at the library. Half time at Atkinson, half time at Stevens Memorial. Yeah, so we're pretty excited about that. Awesome. Nice. Um, what do you mean by embedded? That? Uh, <laughs> that they're embedded in the schools. We're not going to know she. Is. And yeah, <laughs> they, they actually they're employed on the town side, but they're embedded. Decoded. But they're embedded half time in the schools. Thank you. So, do we have a name? Uh, uh, I I don't, don't know. Yeah. yeah, we just got a text that we hired someone soon. a day ago. Oh, okay. but All right. we'll get okay. someone soon. All right. Okay, so we'll continue that. Um, and last, if you go over to the last piece, um, one of the other pieces that we have to do in phase one is. Um, you know, we're pretty keenly aware of what we have for resources and materials at the elementary um, because the, a lot of those are consumables and have to be purchased every year. One of the things we want to get a good handle on, and we have it uh, it's at the secondary level, middle school and high school, is the instructional materials. What do we have? A, a complete inventory of what we actually possess at this time. Uh, we have it done at the high school for English and uh, math and science, I think, are pretty well done, but some of the other areas uh, in the middle school as well as we move forward with some of the recommendations of what we may need for resources. I thought that the comment that you made is that you know we've made a pretty strong case around concerns around class size and need being able to meet the differentiated of all kids but we haven't really made that case of much, or much around instructional materials so we're going to do a whole assessment of our current instructional materials so that we can talk about what is the date of the textbooks that we are using so we're gonna we're gonna do that uh, this fall so we have that for the budget process um, and one last quick thing back to the innovation. Um, you can see that we have an ensure access to travel and service experiences for all students. So we're actually going to be doing a dinner on November 5th um, to raise money for a new fund um, modeled on the uh, Global Education Leadership Fund um, that I've been intimately involved in in Newton to ensure that all kids would be able to have access to these type of authentic experiences. Um, for many of our kids in North Andover, um, they, their families can simply not afford to send them on these trips, and we should ensure that if we're serious, that all kids should be able to have access. So um, we'll be doing a dinner over at Bright Horizons on November 5th, um, and it should be a really fun event. And we'll raise More details to follow. More details to follow. And the, once you see the menu, you'll be coming, I think. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it'll be. Anyways, <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to highlight that it's um, it's exciting to uh, you know I, I feel so strongly that if you're going to have these experiences, they have to be open to all kids. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, uh, absolutely. Um, that's yes, good, Miss Russ. I'll be brief. Um, it looks like there are a few um, deliverables uh, coming out of the who's responsible and when is it due that will likely feed into our budgeting. Yes. So can we at least identify in a coming version of this which are those critical mm -hmm. things that we can be watching? Yeah. Um, the second is uh, it looks like there's some very interesting and um, novel pilots going on. It would be nice to hear before the budget is frozen if there's you know, results from that that we might want to take a look at as part of that process. Yep, we will definitely do that. And then the third comment was, uh, what do we have as a process or um, uh, under whose uh, um, direction will the in, in encumbered instructional materials that we got this year be dispensed? Is that through yours or is there going to be the 55000 that we have as the instructional materials this year? 
How are we going to figure out where that where's that best applied? Oh, that's been that's been spent. Decided. It's gone. Every okay. penny was spent oh, on the yeah. first. Okay. Day. The vast majority of it, just to be very clear, was on the Lucy Caucus, as you okay. know, was part mm -hmm. of tied to the five year plan. Yep. We spent almost all of it on Lucy Caucus materials for our schools. Okay, so that, that enabled us to get that. Absolutely. This year. Perfect. Um, and you know, really, I would say that the instructional materials moving forward will be in line with our five year plan. Yep. Um, I would assume that a good chunk of any money that we have for instructional materials for next year will be in math. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is by charting that five-year plan, we know where our resources are going to go. Okay. Um, that also being said, though, if we are able to get additional funding through Medicaid or um, if we continue to build potential um, non-filled positions so that if we get more elementary school class sizes we can use, um, we really do need to start to address the age of some of our um, middle school and high school materials. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but it, it, our goal, I mean, really that five-year curriculum plan is our guide. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Glick and Mr. Lippert? Um, <coughs> Uh, Mr. Gillian, you talked a lot about uh, what sounds like the curriculum for general ed, but we've been talking a lot about the, the special, the high needs groups that we need to focus on. Does any of this specifically relate to them, or are there special parts of this that relate to them? No, this is all students. So when we talk, for example, about Lucy Tonkins, we're talking about all the professional development. We worked hand in hand. This special educators training with the regular education classroom teachers. Okay. So that's a partnership. Um, you know, there are entry points in, for example, in, in Writer's Workshop in Lucy Conkins for students who may be here, students who are flying up here. Um, so we're training together. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the nice things about having um, Donna here now is we're really being able to collaborate uh, very closely, not only on the professional development piece, but also the communication mechanisms between special education, regular education, uh, intervention, uh, ELL, all those different groups because we're talking about all students. Mm. Because when we looked at our accountability reports, it's typically those groups that need the help to Correct. get us where we need to go. And yeah, that means your emphasis, you know, you, no and, group left behind, no and, court left and behind. And Foundations is actually a Wilson reading program, which is kind of the major interventionist around, uh, around reading. Um, and it's kind of the general ed component, like do this in K1 and 2, and hopefully you'll need us less as mm. you move on. Mm. So um, Foundations is also a Part of that. The, 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 uh, to the, the math coach, um, so this is my anecdotal background in, in math. It's like it's more it's challenging at the elementary level because elementary teachers are way better at reading and writing than they are often at maths. I mean, you'll is see this, that in the literature. Is this, is this enough, fast enough to so to start to move us up on that side of the, of the ledger? A lot of what the coaching is is around what best practice is and mm -hmm. what the best math block looks like. And sometimes, uh, particularly in mathematics, you have to get out of your comfort zone of the traditional uh, uh, chalk and talk or some of the traditional methods that you've seen in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So this would certainly be covering content, but it would also be really uh, coachings about you know those best practices in mathematics in a 60-minute block or a 75-minute block. And really looking at again, you know, you talk about the subgroups and how to incorporate the differentiated instruction mm -hmm. for students so that they have a better understanding of the general conceptual ideas of what mm -hmm. mathematics really are beyond. I have two cubes here and two cubes here, so I have four. Well, what does that really mean? So looking at how to differentiate them. And I'm just echoing Mr. Gross's comments, you know, as we move into the budget, if that's where we need to focus on, we need to focus on attention in terms of funding because there's clear needs there. Yeah, I mean, it goes back, Stan. It goes back to, I mean, if we could hire 15 interventionists right. from mathematics to work with kids. But when, when we're talking about all students and we want to keep all kids in the classroom mm -hmm. uh, and we want to push in services, the more that we can better equip our teachers to help struggling students okay. with everyone together um, is really powerful. And that's where that, that's what I specifically would see for that role. In the, um, the co-curricular act, activities like DECA and robotics, is there any any thought to s sort of take that one step further and do more like pro more project-based learning or something else that sort of formalizes what we've been doing kind of almost ad hoc? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the genesis of a senior capstone project, project is to allow kids to go deep into something mm. um, and to be very project-based learning. And as I've seen those roll out, 
um, I'll just talk about my experience. We rolled it out at Newton North High School, and then in every English class, by the time the kids were seniors, they were going deep on something. When people see that be successful, and if you look, if you'll see expand capstone projects to include middle and elementary grades, I mean, this it, it's a change in approach that can be infused. It's just a wonderful place to start because when teachers see kids get turned on and going deep and exciting, it really does infiltrate the rest of the curriculum. Mm. I have experience with that. And, I, and it's just to tie that back to one other thing, I think in the beginning somewhere here it talks about depth and distance, okay. and those are two critical words that tie <clears throat> all this together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, from the just make a quick David? moment. Um, you know, it, it's funny that I, I actually didn't even notice that it had the elementary, but you know, I know at Kittredge they, they do the expert project, which is a little bit of like the go deep thing. Yeah. But um, as you started talking about bringing it down every year, I mean, that's what they get excited about. It and is. I mean, the, like, I'm a third grader. We're already in anticipation of what that fifth grade, you know, <laughs> expert project is going to be. Right. So, um, as it starts to get rolled down, I can really see, you know, the momentum start um, to build itself up. So that's great. That's great. Hmm. Any other questions? Nothing. Thank you. I, I think um, before. Can I just have that yeah. document I gave you, Mr. Lewis, right there? Yes. yes. Thank you. We're going to move on to the. Um, the next part of the agenda, which is the superintendent school committee goals. We kind of left one piece of um, the strategic vision out there, but I think that's going to tie into the, one of our, hopefully our biggest, our biggest goal going forward. And I think, you know, the superintendent could, could kick off with that and hopefully will lead to discussion about all the uh, our goals. I also want to recognize that we've been joined by some members of the FinCom, uh, so we thank you for, for thank coming you for today. Here. And I, I think that uh, it, the board would indulge questions from you later on um, after we get through some of the presentation, if you'd like. It's up to you. Superintendent. Yeah, so I, the part that we did miss out, uh, we just skipped over, because I think that we may want to go a little deeper, is um, this, this focus on decreasing class sizes with a specific focus on elementary class sizes um, in order to better meet the needs of our kids. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about this and the need for this, and I think with the increased complexity of the students, we have the privilege to educate class sizes of that we are currently experiencing make it very difficult to meet the diverse needs of our kids, and I, I, I think we all agree to that. Um, so the question just becomes, how do we do that? Um, as I've articulated a number of times, um, you know, you could say, Jen, hire 10 more elementary school teachers, and I'd say, thank you very much, I have nowhere to put them. So the biggest issues become not only the teachers, um, but the additional classroom space uh, that is needed. Um, and as you guys know, there was a memo sent to you today by Andrew Mailer and myself about kind of the process for that um, and I just wanted to quickly highlight that um, we have retained an architect K B and A architects um, and we have quickly met with them to talk about um, please doing a feasibility study of where we could add additional um, classrooms um, and um, there are kind of uh, two possibilities that um, have emerged. The first is the one that we anticipated, which was could we add six to eight additional classrooms on one of our elementary schools? Um, we've really asked the architects to look at the feasibility of that at three of our elementary schools, which is um, the Kittredge, the Atkinson, and the Franklin. Um, the Thompson land parcel is just, we believe, too small. Mm -hmm. um, and Sargent is, um, the location is really tricky to get other kids out to Sargent. Um, mm -hmm. And second, it historically has our lowest class sizes and so we feel that the three schools with the highest impact would be those so they're going to look at those three schools um, and say if we added six to eight classrooms um, what would be the four or potentially four to six I think was in the original um, I just keep hoping so from four to six uh, <laughs> yeah. additional classrooms um, the number grows right? that's what you want the superintendent to do so yeah. um, and um, you know there's complexities with each of the schools are they sprinklered or are they not as you know if you add additional classroom spaces to a non sprinkler building the entire building has to be sprinkled and so it's all of those um, situations the other possibility that has emerged and it was really why we wrote the memo is um, whether or not to uh, recreate a Bradstreet model and create a kinder garden complex um, and have that be part of the ECC complex so that um, our most uh, students with the most needs would not have to make a transition from preschool to kindergarten to elementary. They would actually be able to stay from preschool into kindergarten. Um, 
And we I need to understand the possibility of that. That has all sorts of complications in terms of busing, in terms of, um, you know, what does that mean for the kindergartners to be going to their own school and not feeling connected um, to their home school. Um, there are some real positives of that if, if that's done uh, for all of our kindergartens, we, we potentially free up 15 classrooms across the district, which allows us to impact every school. Um, probably reduces the need for redistricting. Um, if we add six or so in one school, we're going to have to do some significant redistricting. What we've really asked KBNA to do is go out and talk to us about the costs of these. We will do some work around the busing. We, our new um, bus uh, software allows us to say, if we were going to do a kindergarten route, how many additional buses would we need, and what would that look like? It's probably not additional buses. It's probably just additional runs. But what that would that cost be for us? Um, if we were going to do this route, what would we? How many would we do around? Re, uh, sorry, this uh, approach redistricting. So that my our hope is. Um, to have working with the small elementary feasibility um, uh, subcommittee who will meet with the architects a few times, our hope is to have a finalized report to all of you on the, at the December 1st meeting to really kind of get deep into what is the recommendation of the school committee. Um, and then to start working with the town manager um, and the board of selectmen in January to really come and settle on uh, something that we hope to propose to the town uh, you know, this is, of course, I'm aggressively and half full on all of this, but that we would be able to propose to the town at town meeting in the spring um, so that we could start moving quickly with the goal, if we could, of having something online September of 18 mm -hmm. um, so that we could start to address that graph um, and the concerns we have. So um, that is the process. Um, we don't quite know where it's going to take us, um, and we think it's pretty important to understand that there is this additional wrinkle of do we recreate a Bradstreet um, because we think it, it makes sense to explore that as an option um, and not limit ourselves to just adding on to one of the three existing elementaries. Can you describe what? I'm sorry. Can I ask you a question? Um, I was just going to. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you describe why you think that's a complication? Well, in, in the original, uh, I want to get the right language because I get it wrong all the time. In the original facilities master plan, it was just adding additional classrooms onto um, to an additional. So the complication is we're steering away from the facilities master plan. Um, and most likely the cost of something like that um, may be a little bit more um, because we would be adding 15 or 16 classrooms rather than four to six. Mm -hmm. Another part that's kind of overshadowing this, this conversation, and this is where I want Mr. Mailer to jump in. Um, I think some of you on the email Mr. Mailer put out, um, I think it was last week, and talked about a lot of the developments that are in town that are in the pipeline right now. And he estimated in the next uh, four to five years that on the low end, um, the population of North Andrew could increase by 4,000. On the high end, it could increase as high as 5,000. Now, what that means as far as how many kids come into our schools, you know, when developers make proposals, you know, historically, I, I would say not all of them, but some lowball it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Mr. Mealy w w went to a planning board meeting last week, um, and talk this week was this week, mm -hmm. and discussed it. And maybe this is a good time for you to, to jump in and talk about um, your comments and how you come up with some of your models, so to speak. Sure. Um, it's really the driver behind is going from a six classroom project to help us uh, remove our portables to a discussion about possibly having the Bradstreet model and creating 15 classrooms that allow us to both do the portables and impact class size. Because when we originally put together the facilities master plan, it, the enrollment projections were that we were going to start to go down a little bit right. each year. <laughs> yep. um, and that has not been the case. These developments continue to come in. And so I went to the planning board to make them aware of that. What happens anytime there's a development, uh, the school department gets to provide input um, as to how, what kind of impact that might have. Um, this specific one that I went to talk to is the Princeton development up on 125 across from Barker Farms. And in all likelihood, the projections that they put forward are probably pretty accurate because um, the variables aren't really there for a lot of students. It's, it's hard to believe sometimes um, 
and as I said to them, the general public tends to say, okay, 192 units, that's going to be 100 students easy. <laughs> right. And in fact, it isn't. Um, there are only one and two bedroom apartments in their market rate apartments. Um, so in all likelihood, we would get maybe 20 students out of something like that, which seems hard to believe, but in that case, it's probably be accurate. But what's happened is, in most cases, we get the developer's projections, and they're low. And we do our own projections based on what we've seen in North Andover, and ours turn out to be lower than what we see. Um, so we're both wrong, but they're more wrong in most cases than we are. Um, for instance, Kittredge um, Stevens Crossing, right down the street here, mm -hmm. the projections from the scientific model used by the developer uh, was for 12 students to be generated from that mm -hmm. development. We're at 31 students right now, and that could have increased again today and maybe tomorrow. Um, so they were off by almost three times um, the number. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we've seen is that the numbers tend to be low on these developments. But what I wanted, really wanted to make the planning board aware is that these are impacting us because where we thought we were going to ease the crunch, it hasn't, and it's starting to impact it even more. And we're at capacity. You know, there's no more rooms to create um, other classrooms in, in lower uh, class size. Uh, so as these developments come in, it makes it even more difficult. And it's the reason why, as I said, the, uh, this project has turned from let's just get the portables out of circulation to let's see if we can really do something about increasing our capacity. Um, so that's where we are. Yeah, it's really a two two pronged. You know, we have to increase capacity to deal with the additional students, and where we are right now is not where we want to be. So it's really a two pronged. And to do that, to just get the portables offline, we're not going to, we're not most likely not going to be able to do either one. Now, when when we talk about another type of development like Berry Street, which is 40B, is there a different kind of an impact potentially? Uh, from yeah, that, the, the multiplier that they use definitely goes up if it's uh, 40B versus market rate. Mm -hmm. um, so using our own experience, we're going to be somewhere between 40 and 50 students from the Berry Street from development. And the other part that people don't realize is that as a development matures, it tends to increase in the number of students mm -hmm. in that development. Huh. Interesting. Royal Crest is an example of that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Mr. Lippert? Um I, I did, but I forgot. Okay, so. Sorry. I have one. Ms. Um, so, anybody who's here know or remember, I know when we closed Brad Street, there were issues with the building itself. Mm -hmm. Were there any comments or issues about a separated kindergarten? Pro or so, so, I'll give you my answer. <laughs> okay. experience. So, I had two, two students that went through Brad Street mm -hmm. and had a wonderful experience there. There was no issues or problems or you know, separation trauma or having to switch too frequently from between schools. They had a wonderful time. And because it, the focus was all on that one grade level, and there were, you know, the, not only the student body, but the events and all of the activities that they, they participated in were just very specific to what they all were doing at that age level. And they had a wonderful time. And, you know, they were sad. They were very sad when Brad Street closed. So uh, anecdotally, they, they had a wonderful I think, experience. I think the teachers felt the same. I was going to ask. Yeah, the I would also like to comment. It's not anecdotal. Our kids both went to Brad Street as well. The sense of community at that school is phenomenal. As the, as the students grew and went into extracurricular activities, such as Little League and soccer, they knew each other. And that was a very big um, um, benefit as they advanced to their own elementary schools where they had different you know, subgroups. So, so you do this, you start together, yep. you go apart, and then you come back together in high school, right? Or, or middle school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it was a very positive experience and a good community that was created for families and students. And you said the teachers and also? Yeah, so I, yeah. I asked, looked to Mr. Gilligan, but when I've talked to like Mrs. Gaffney, who spoke, that, who taught there, and some other more veteran teachers, they talk very fondly of the community, you know, the kindergarten. Um, two other things, you know, this situation we had with kindergarten accreditation, it would be one building rather than... Huh. Um, and then the other really nice thing is, um, you know, right now we have differential of kindergarten class sizes across the board. It would be great to have kindergarten class sizes be the same so mm -hmm. they could be as mm -hmm. low as possible across the board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kindergarten is such an important year. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could have one space where the average class size was 20 or something, can you mm -hmm. imagine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming that with the 
standalone kindergarten model, we would still get rid of the so-called portables, yes, the five right. portables. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think we're, we're quite well, we're there. Not there we're yet. not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, but do right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any line of thought or any other questions? Well, I was just, I wanted to know, the, the, really the only reason then for closing that was the physical condition of the building. The, I think There were no other right. reasons weighing on that decision. Mm, yeah, I don't think so. I, I just want to uh, emphasize that this is going to be a big discussion, and I, I like the approach that we're taking. It's consistent with the town managers. You know, we, we, we are very thoughtful in year one, and we execute in year two. Um, I also want to make sure that we ventilate our options thoroughly with the public, because this will have profound impact at town meeting as we are either asking to fund it or have to justify what we're not doing, you know, the cheaper or the more expensive trash. Yeah, that's so right. I think we definitely need enough public input into this as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this is this is uh, the very beginning of the process. Um, you have the timeline. Everyone received the timeline of the uh, of the consultant, and uh, you know we are going to include the public the, the whole way because we have not made any decisions as far as going forward with this. But I think, in light of uh, our already, as the superintendent uh, pointed out already, our class size is already too big at the elementary level. Um, it seems to me very clearly that they're going to get bigger. So it's important to act. You know, probably probably this year, um, and we'll go forward forward with this process, and we will keep the public involved the the entire way. Uh, one more question, yep, sure, absolutely. Dr. Price. You said on December first there'd be a report. Is that going to be with the best option or a, the all best the suggestion options. or the all, all, the all of the options? Thank the you. The whole idea here is really to say, okay, here are the options, here are the pros, Good. here are the cons, here's the cost. Thank you. Here's another option, pros, cons, costs. So our hope is, and you know, as we start to talk about this even more with the, the, the public, FinCom, everybody, that people will see that we're really taking this and looking at every option. Um, we have definitely said to the architects, this community deserves and needs to look at every option. Um, you know, the one decision that we have made is not to look at Sargent, and I, I hope that that resonates if that's not the right answer. Um, but it does seem like that, you know, I, I also want to be have this be as quick and as cost efficient as possible. And I and I really do think that the, the three options are really those three schools. Uh, um, you know, Thompson. We just want to make sure the parcel. Right. Um, but you know, having those four schools pretty close together means you could move kids. Um, mm -hmm. Sergeant is just so complicated and far away. It's not so far, but farther away. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the only decision that's been made at this point. The, the just to sure, sort of to, to sort of get all the information out. So we still do, the town still owns that parcel next to the Foster Farm soccer field. It was going to be used to build an elementary school, right? That was going to be the plan. And one of the implied reasons for closing the Bradstreet was because we are going to be building another elementary school at some point. So that was sort of, not directly tied, but it was in many people's minds linked because we are going to have this new school, it's going to take the load off the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that, could you ever foresee that being one of the possibilities of building So I think if we were really going to address <laughs> the kindergarten issue, um, I would not want a standalone kindergarten space again for kind of thinking about the transition for our most needy mm -hmm. kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And so educationally, it feels very, it makes the most sense to me to have it be part of the ECC complex okay. um, so that the kids who start with us at three and need intense interventions are not transitioning three times to I get, get to elementary school. Okay. And okay. so, um, you know, I think that the decisions we make need to be fiscally responsible, and I also think we need to take in the needs of educationally. Mm -hmm. So that is really why I think that makes the most sense. The reality is also fiscally, um, we have some infrastructure there. We have a main office, we have a nurse, we have a, and, and right. mm -hmm. we, we've got to be really thoughtful here. Yeah, um, no, I understand. Because you know, we keep talking about elementary school class sizes, and and I want to be very cognizant, but you know, our largest class sizes are at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So this is really the beginning of a process, mm -hmm. and we want to demonstrate fiscal responsibility to this town and thoughtful planning so that hopefully, and I'm getting, this is a, one step in a process. Good, Mr. Mr. Gosh, sure. good. So uh, I, I, it makes sense. I think as part of our narrative, it's important to include the legacy thinking of what we thought was going to happen and why that's no longer Correct. a viable option. Just yep. to make sure that it contains that history. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So I, I think as we go this part, this is going to be a very tangible goal for the school committee to, to get this done. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe we can just jump into superintendent's goals and talk about how we're going to 
Yeah. Try to mesh the two. Then. So one of the things we thought about is, as you, if you remember last year, I had the five goals and I reported and visibility and all of that stuff. Um, one of the things that when I met with uh, the chair and the vice chair of the school committee was the reality of the situation is my goal is the strategic plan. I mean, this is here. It's clear. It's comprehensive. Um, and, you know, in some cases it's measurable, in other cases it's not. I really do understand that in some cases I don't control some of this, but I really see my goals and your measure of my effectiveness on whether or not I can implement this plan. And it seems redundant to me to go through a whole goals process when really this is the document that's gonna be guiding me this year um, and against which I would be happy to be measured. Um, am, I, am I making this happen? Um, and are we making this happen? I mean, I think the reality is, as you've seen, the assistant superintendents are as invested in this as I am. It's, this is not just me. So, um, so the thought was, rather than go through a massive goals process to just say, my goal is to implement the strategic plan, and when we get to the end of the year, you can look at my work against that, um, rather than kind of create a whole bunch of other goals that might be sidetracked from what I really see as the important work, my important work, and our important work this year. Um, that was my initial thinking about my goals. And as we had that discussion with Mr. Limpert and, and um, the superintendent, I felt that, um, I, I always felt that we don't need to have separate school committee goals per se. I think our job is to support the superintendent and her team as much as possible. Um, and if, if one of the thing, one of the, the, the clear goals that I think we're talking about is decreasing class size, if we can, you know, at the end of uh, June 30th, 2017, come up with a, a hard plan that's supported by all three boards, town meeting, I think we, we would have accomplished a lot this year. But um, I wanted to kind of throw it out to the group and see um, how you, we could wordsmith some, some specific things if, if we feel we need to do that. But um, I think the strategic vision that the superintendent's laid out um, and some of the, the, the goals, I don't want to call them smaller goals, but the, some of the goals that she wants to accomplish, I, I don't, besides providing resources, I don't see how the school committee is really going to influence those goals, you know? Um, so with that being said, I, I'll, you know, open up for some, some discussion. Ms. Lippert, you, if you want to add on to that, you were in the middle of this. <coughs> no, I, 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 as I had, uh, as uh, we've said in the past, we've, we have in the past struggled for, to create school committee goals. And we've struggled to develop superintendent's goals, too. So it's not without some strain that we've tried to go through this process, in some cases solely for the purpose of having goals we could measure or something. So I, I have no problem about abandoning things that were only fabricated because we needed them. I, I don't have any problem with that. I, I'm, you know, I'm okay not doing stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm just as happy. That could be a campaign slogan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I, I, the only thing I would say is that I think if we want to do this and sort of have one, all agree that we're all going to work on one or two or three goals. I just think it might be helpful for us to each look at our, what may be unique perspectives or, or whatever we, our particular view or input is to that process, where the school committees may be somewhat different. And, you know, Mr. Tracy, you've said, you, you've sort of identified part of that, which is an advocacy goal, which is not necessarily the superintendent's role, you know. So that may be part of our uh, implementing our part of the class size, getting the money goal. Uh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, if, if this report comes back and, and, and it, we have a clear um, mission, whether mm -hmm. it, it's adding on um, modulars or, mm -hmm. or, yeah. or adding on to the, the ECC, I think it's our responsibility to the school committee to get out with the public, wherever it may be, yeah. and, and that, that's a, a clear, definable goal for us. I, I think so, and I think, you know, it's just in, our, in, in everybody's best interest, maybe the public's too, is we write that down on a piece of paper so that we just know when we go do it, we can check off that box. We said, okay, we did that. You know, we, we provided the advocacy. We, uh, we went out to the public or we went to the boards and we made the case and, you know, in, in concert with the, the administration. So I think that's good. It, but I have no problem having one or two or three goals. That's, I think that makes all kinds of sense. Mr. Gross, sure. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I like the simplicity and the integration between the accountability in the strategic plan. 
Um, but for me, my goals at work help me prioritize when I've got 17 number one priorities. And it's really a, a clarification, at least in my mind, of what is the, the committee's thoughts on what are the priorities moving forward. Um, while the goals aren't explicitly numbered, you're one, one, two, and three, it gives at least the, the compass of what is viewed as the priorities. Um, I agree the strategic plan uh, addresses a lot of those, but I think there's going to be a lot of um, vacillation in what we can accomplish in phase one, what we have to defer to phase two, what is subject to, uh, to uh, you know, funding for next year. And I'm just, I, I just want to make sure that if we do go forward with that approach where there isn't a clear um, um, goal setting for the superintendent, that we don't miss that opportunity given how in the past over the years we've seen these are our intentions but here are the 17 reasons why we weren't able to succeed or we've made a directional change or a pivot for good reason and that's no longer relevant so i just want to i want to have that conversation as well so in terms of me in terms of my goals um you know i, I think about the goals i had last year um you know the one i added around visibility right um i mean i'm gonna be visible like that's just not an issue i mean i, I will quit this job before i stop being visible i mean it's what i love to do um, so, you, you know what I mean? So, you know, I'm thinking about kind of pushing me and um, my response to that might be to take of these 11 strategic initiatives, um, spend some time between now and the next meeting and I think maybe you guys do the same. I mean, I think decreasing class size is one that you should definitely be. Mm -hmm. um, but I could say, okay, you know, all I would like to be held responsible to, for all of these, but kind of the two or three where I would be putting my most effort would be right. mm -hmm. these. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, sharing this with the district, sharing this with the community, and prioritizing these 11 initiatives, I think my goal should be around those 11. Now, if I prioritize one more over the other, then I'm happy to do that. And, and I, I agree. My concern is there are 11. Yeah, so if, I, so if I pick two or three, they're kind of where I am going to put my energy. I think that it's a reasonable. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And we could do the same. Yeah. Yeah, and then and if they line up, <laughs> yeah, 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 or maybe they shouldn't line up. And I don't mean that in a in right. a you yeah. know I mean part of the you know in order to and, and I you know the other thing that will trickle down is for instance you know as as Dr. Strait and I sit down and do her goals for the year I would be. Um, most likely one of two or three of these initiatives that may not be the same as mine are going to be her goals. Right. Same for Mr. Right. Mealy and same for Mr. Gilligan. So between exactly. all of us, it's we'll have them covered. Right. Exactly. But some of the goals that you, they have revolve around money. Yes. And that and, may and be where you're that, involved. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 uh, I can guarantee that. We, 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 can't, we can't hold, um, you said, uh, dot, dot just straight responsible for that, though. Correct. So, I mean, she can have that as a goal, but... If the money's not there, it's not there. But I can hold her responsible for thinking about how to support social emotional learning in our students. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's something, one of the reasons we brought her here. So, mm -hmm. so frankly, I think we'll be successful if the narrative right. to that point is successful. Yeah. But, and Mr. Treasy, to your point, to the extent that, that we can show the need for funds because we've asked people to do stuff that they cannot do without money. Then it's sort of back to the, back to the community to say, okay, right. yeah. you give us money, here's what we can do, here's what we've signed up to be able to, to produce, hypothetically. And no funding, no output. I mean, so it gives us, I think, some good leverage in terms of budgets and uh, funding, at least to have a, have a stronger narrative, a stronger you know, narrative. something that, that really couples money to results. That's what we need to be able to, to do your per pupil spending, you know, rock bottom deal, right? Yeah. You've got to have that that story, that well, narrative. I, I think we, we've talked. Spending unto itself is, isn't a goal. Spending is is a means right. to get to that goal. Right. right. Um, do you want to add anything? No, no. Ms. Mabley? I just want to clarify. So what we're saying is, and I, I agree, creating something separate it seemed crazy, but it's already been created. But we're look. We would then look at. The phase one actions. Yes, that would be the area we would yeah. look at, and um, make them as quantifiable as possible, and measurable, which is to Brian's, Mr. Gross's point, yeah. as possible. Yeah. Final sure. Final, absolutely. Good. Final thought. If that's what we're going to do, then we might need just to scrub the process yeah. and policy to ensure that it's compatible with what we say we're supposed to do. And if the answer is one goal, execute that. That's cool. All right. 
I have to say, I think that there are some processes and policies in place for superintendent goals. Many school committees don't have goals, so it would be more based on my, yeah. mm -hmm. um, on, on, on me making one a student learning goal and me making one a professional practice goal and us figuring that out. But I think we can do that. But I think the, the new superintendent on the boarding process did require that we, Correct. as a committee, establish what we knew we would do anyway. Yeah. So, so I don't know if I'm, yeah, I'm hearing you correctly, but would you feel a better if, if the superintendent um, went to her strategic plan and pulled out what the goals are of this and make it a little more quantifiable? Is that what, what you're asking for? Ranked, or ranked? Or ranked? Or, I mean, two or three. Yeah, so what, what, what I'd like to see is the, the trickle down into the benchmarks and the deliverable dates so that just you know, like I did last year. Just like you did last year. Yeah. Um, and then for the ones that I'd like to hear the superintendent make a recommendation of, these are the ones that are either the highest impact or the biggest at risk that she will take, you know, focus on. Um, let us digest the information and reflect on that. And then, again, as Mr. Lippert indicated, either we're going to be perfectly aligned or we'll have a discussion. But yeah, I, I, don't I think, can do that at our next school. I, I don't feel comfortable saying, here, execute. And that's what you're accountable for, because I, I think, it, as you said, it depends on how you manage your your your, uh, your resources and, and the resources that we were able to help uh, solicit out of. Uh, and if and if I pick two resources. or three of these, my expectation, just even looking at this after your comments, Mr. Brooks, is that my the assistant superintendents will be responsible for the ones that I'm not. Right. right, right, and that and that's that's the way to set those priorities so that. You know, as long as the work gets done, we don't care. Right, it doesn't absolutely. have to be you doing it. Correct. You don't have to do all 11, right? Yeah, so no, but you're responsible. Right. But that's, I'm just looking at them. I think we could, you, you know, you that would, would say. Be, that would be the perfect solution, right? So right. everybody gets enough, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think if this vision is, is implemented, I think we're going to have a great, successful district here, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. even more so. And whatever we can do as a school committee to support um, the superintendent and her team, that's what I see as our goal today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Um, I, I had suggested. Um, okay, so that's that's new business right there. I had suggested if if uh, I know the FinCom is here, if they would want to say a few words or <laughs> come here to listen, and be uh, enlightened by some of the, the discussion. Mr. Callahan, please enlighten us. I apologize for my. Uh, Sartorial split, yeah. sartorial <laughs> splitter. <laughs> this was like you're just back from the FinCom basketball game, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very for, much for the record. Uh, oh, uh, Bill Callahan, 23 Lime on the Road. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, the discussion. It was very enlightening, and I think it was interesting. Um, I was thinking about a number of these issues last, and the committee was last budget cycle. Um, and in fact, I went back to the strategic, to the facilities master plan um, that is now, you know, quite old. Like I think the work, the kind of legwork and the consulting work was going on in 2008, 2009. Mm. Um, and that's when the, the sort of studies were done. And I looked with particular interest at the, at the section on classrooms, which was um, quite literally at the end, I think it was on page 351 <laughs> of, the, of the plan which was, you know, quite a thick document. And it basically consisted of um, one spreadsheet and probably about three to $500 of an architect's time, which I can kind of guesstimate because that's what I do, um, you know, laying out some sort of a planning exercise. And it had a very, very round numbers. The report itself had very round numbers on sort of adding classrooms, you know, at the big range. Um, and in the final sort of... Um, what do we call it? Fiscal puzzle, putting together the pieces uh, and how the different pieces of the facilities master plan could replace debt that was rolling off uh, the town's books. So as you know, other projects like the high school and, and so forth, as that debt was paid down and we had different sized chunks over different years, trying to you know do the number one thing we should always do as a town, you know, is be prudent with our funds and not overspend anywhere. It did seem like the very end of that report and the suggested the analysis and the recommended budget number, which I remember being somewhere about 1.5 or 1.7 million dollars, did not coincide. But it did not get the same scrutiny that the fire department and the public works building and the senior center and some of the other, um, you know, many of the other important town facilities um, received. So um, you know, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying 
You know, I think in the narrative about how this, about how we as a, as a community deal with our, uh, our school needs, um, I would encourage people to correct the narrative about the facilities master plan and say that that was what was decided to be done uh, back in 2008 and 2009. Because I don't think it was a very deliberate decision based on, um, you know, A, the projections have changed a little bit, but secondly, I, I just don't think it got the level of thought and analysis that many other parts of the plan did. Um, and we have started to talk as a committee uh, last year with, um, with town manager, with the town manager about, you know, what would facilities master plan two look like? What should we be looking at and how should we perform this analysis? So I, I would, I, you know, I will happily repeat that narrative uh, and repeat that story because I think it's, it's an important aspect to this. And so I wouldn't be defensive as a committee and as a school department to say, oh, well, we said we were going to do 1.5. The school department didn't say they were going to do $1.5 million worth of construction. Mm -hmm. That was the facilities master plan group put together. And the number one thing that the facilities master plan and the genius of it and the genius in its execution is that it put out a lot of important goals, that it set forward a process that was repeatable and scalable and just knocked down an amazing number of projects over the past few years that it stymied the town for years and years and years. Uh, you know, the, the fire department being, you know, exhibit number one. <laughs> and so, you know, I think I would encourage the committee to think, especially at this time when we are like, we're going to get a lot more buildings built at interest rates like they are now than we are at any other time. Um, and I think another important thing that the committee has talked about over the years is, you know, what's our existing stock? You know, how do we make sure that, the, that as a town we're looking at the, our buildings and our physical plants and saying, what's the 20-year plan? Like, when's the time limit on the Franklin? When's the time limit on Atkinson? What are these things doing? You know, because I think it's, it's very easy in towns, in municipal government, which I study uh, with an annoying passion to my wife and other people, <laughs> is that people always say, well, they, first they said this, and then they said that, you know? First they said this, and then they said that. The, the story's always changing, so why don't we just say no? Because that's the best answer to come up with, you know? Like this, oh, you said you needed a few elementary school classes, now you're saying you need a kindergarten building. You know, you said, you, you know, then you're going to come back in three years and say you need to do a few million dollars at the Franklin. You know, so I would encourage, I would encourage, and, you know, I hope I can spark the conversation amongst, you know, the different groups in town to take a longer look and maybe make it a special focus of facilities master plan number two. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you look at the, at the number of projects that have, that have been completed. The school committee has had some very important projects done. Um, I mean, the school department as a whole, um, Kittredge Gym, the building that we're in right now, um, you know, some other things that were important. But I think it's really important to take the long view and to make sure we're layering all these things on top of each other mm -hmm. so that the story can be a 20-year story or a 15-year story that you know, you can come back to kind of year after year. Yeah. And that's, that's really my point. So, uh, so well, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I, I do appreciate your comments and you being here uh, means a lot to this, to this board. I, I agree with you 100%. The, this they say thing is, is tough to overcome. And, but I think this, the, board, the, the number one job of this board is to, to go to the public and, and, and say this is why this should be done. Right. Um, and I know your board, um, it will work with us to find the, the, the best way uh, and the most prudent way to, to get that done. Um, Mr. Lumpert, I'm sorry. Well, I, I just wanted to ask you, Mr. Kelly, and you talk about facilities master plan too, but the town manager has also proposed like a town master plan, right. a, a different document. Right. And I think that addresses some of the other uh, issues that you we talked about tonight. Um, increasing enrollments, uh, new development in town. I think that all is in that plan and that's the 10 15 20 year outlook right. there that we also need uh as as sort of the corollary document to a facilities master plan and i've 
always imagined that facilities master plan two would be more about schools than about municipal buildings because we've done all the municipal buildings we're right. done so now it would be about franklin or the middle school or or whatever we need to be thinking about to you know address some of the issues that we will and do have so i think you know any support you want to give us on that would be great mr bailey i can add i, I think you'll be pleased to know that the intent for this year's um cip plan our requests um, included identifying exactly what you're saying um, franklin what would be needed to get that back to where it needs to be the middle school those are our two biggest needs um, but with the with the awareness that they could get rolled into the next facilities master plan but at least they've been identified right. so that if that doesn't happen they're still there but that's our plan this year thank you any questions thank you very much you're welcome thank, thank you Callahan. I appreciate it and thank you for coming um, last item on the agenda is a uh, public comment that was the public. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jen might want to say something. Come on. No, good. She's wicked smart. Yeah, wicked smart. <laughs> yeah. Do um, not say anything. Uh, from the board, Mr. Leppert, anything? Miss Mabley? Set. Uh, I'm just uh, excited for the school year to begin. Um, and uh, I wish everyone, uh, the faculty, the staff, and the students, uh, the best for this academic year. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, you may have seen the uh, posters around town. October 1st, 4 p.m. at the uh, Joe Foss uh, Stadium at the high school is our annual marching band competition. And if you haven't driven by the high school uh, during the evening hours or at some field in town um, to hear the uh, creation of the new show, I highly recommend it. So I look forward to uh, seeing folks there. Um, it's a great evening and uh, always a very um, Good fundraiser for the enrichment program for the chorus band and music programs in school <laughs> uh, rumor has it that there might be a wiffle ball team at next week's wiffle ball uh, to uh, honor uh, tim, tim. tim. Um, uh, not tim robinson no. uh, oh to, uh, mr black Yes. Yes. Um, Miss, yeah. And uh, the, the wiffle ball team may uh, com be comprised of Mr. Mealy, Mr. Gilligan, and myself. So if the uh, nice. is next, uh, next Sunday, um, and we're throwing down the gauntlet, we've been practicing all summer. So. <laughs> <laughs> d d does Vegas have a lineup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The school committee would like to have a group of three, you know, challenges for all day. So. Um, when is that again? It's next Sunday. Um, where? From 1 to 4. Shmeli, do you have where? There's signs it. around town. What? Location. Yeah. It's where is it? The signs around town. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Read the signs. I, no, I, I, I think it's uh, probably my guess would be the middle school. I think so, it's yeah. middle. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll see what the other board members do, but I, I know uh, it's my birthday, and I'm told I'm going to Storyland for my birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really Way better deal. Right? Way better deal. Wow. Yes, going to Storyland. What, yeah. what is happening? My, kid, my kids are asleep right now, so that's yeah, surprising. That's, 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 that's how I want to celebrate my birthday. So if you're looking to join the Whiffle Ball Tournament, come out and support us or throw eggs at us, whichever you prefer. Oh, super. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for participating today. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all the ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you.